Hi, Ginger. How are you? First day at work? Yeah, it's always the toughest, isn't it? <clears throat> Meh. <laughs> Mr. Timothy Moore. Is the musician that we are listening to at the moment. Though I will be stopping him in a sack as we are about to go read. Uh, stop, I shall. Thank you. I am good. Yeah. That's good, not awesome. Yeah. Um I'm I'm very sorry, but it takes a lot for me to be awesome. So But I've changed my uh, my work schedule, and that is unfortunately not something that I have any influence on. But because of the time that I have to appear at work, I can't rest in after I sent the boys to school. So that's why I'm just good, sweetie. <laughs> um, I'm gonna ask you guys how how is my voice compared to the to the fire and rain? Is it too much? Is it too little? What? Is there something I need to adjust? No? Everything is good? What what should be a bit louder? My voice or the rain?
I sound like I'm a bit away from the mic. Hmm. Is this better? Okay, good. <clears throat> Excuse me, guys. Today... <laughs> it's Spoonie. I love you too, Spoonie. <laughs> uh, but if I go sleep now, I can't sleep later. So... I'm sorry about that, but today we yes yes. First of all, we're gonna give Spoony a shout out. Go check him out. He's a cheeky sweet. Um, but today we're gonna read the Infernal City, which is ESL lore. Um. And I'm very sorry if I'm slaughtering the names in here. <clears throat> I'm so bad at that. So we're going to start with the prologue. When Ifek felt the sea shudder, he knew. The wind has already fallen like a dead thing from the sky. Gasping as it succumbed upon the iron swells, breathing its last to his mariner's ears. The sky always knew first. The sea was slow, dreadful slow, to come around. The sea shook again, or rather seemed to drag beneath the their keel. Up in the crow's nest, Keen screamed as he was tossed out like a kitten. Ifik watched him twist and almost impossibly catch the rigging with those Cathay rat claws of his. Stendar, Grain swore in her south nibbin twang. What was that? A tsunami? Her feeble human gaze searched out through the dusk. No, Ifek murmured. I was off the Somerset Isle when the sea tried to swallow them. And I felt one of those pass under us. And another, when I was younger, off the coast of Morrowind. In deep water you don't feel much. This is deep water. Then what? She brushed her silver and grey bangs off her useless eyes. Ifik twitched his shoulders in imitation of a human shrug and ran his claws through the patchy fur of his forearm. The still air smells sweet like rotting fruit. See anything, Keem? He called up. My own death, nearly. The Nair Quinn alien cat shouted back, his voice rasping hollow, as if the ship was in a box. Hi, Wolfie! How are you, sweetheart? Yes! Yes! yes. You're dead tired? 
Oh, sweetie. Editing sucks. Yeah. Well, at least you know how to do it. <laughs> he lithely hauled his slick body back into the nest. Nothing on the sea, he continued after a moment. It's an AJ. Hi, sweetie. Under it, then? Graham said nervously. Yes. yes! Yes! How are you, AJ? He fixed his head. The wind, he said. And then he saw it. In the south. A sudden blackness. A crackle of green lightning. And then a form like a tall thunderhead billowed into being. Hold on, he shouted. And now came a clap like thunder, but 40 times louder. And a new fist of wind that snapped the main mast, taking poor Keen to the death he had nearly seen. Then all was still again, except for the roaring in his damaged ears. By the gods, what can it be? He barely heard Grain ask. It's a hearse! You know what? We should have a stream for naughty stories as well. Who is with me? I am not gonna read naughty stories. Jesus, guys. No, 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 no. You can do that. You try to make me read some... Well, the Lusty Agonian Maid is not naughty naughty, okay? It's just innuendi, innuendos. <laughs> All right, Ginger, got to go home. See you later. Take care, okay? That's why you read the text in a redeem. No, I did read the text. I just wanted you to read it anyway. <laughs> All right, where were we? By the gods, what can it be? He barely heard Grain ask. The sea doesn't care, Ifix said. Watching the dark mass move toward them, he looked around his ship. All of the masts were broken, and it appeared that half the crew was already gone. What? Not many Kashyyyk take to the sea, he said. They'll bear it for trade, to move Skuma around. But few there are who love her. But I've adored her since I could mew. And I love her because she doesn't care what the gods or Daedra think. She's another world with her own rules. We already know Mama has a paddle in her office. Wonder what else is in there. I heard that was a whip. <laughs> Oh my gosh. You guys already. Jesus. That's too early.
What are you going on about? I'm not sure, he admitted. I feel it. I don't think it. But don't you think? Doesn't it feel like... He didn't finish. He didn't need to. Grain stared out toward the thing. I see it now, she said. Yes. I saw an oblivion gate open once, she said. When my father worked in Leowin, I saw things. It feels a little like that. But Martin's sacrifice, they said, it can't happen again. And it doesn't look like a gate. It wasn't shaped like a thunderhead, the effect realized. More like a fat cone, point down. Another wind was starting up, and on it, something unbelievably foul. It doesn't matter what it is, he said, not to us. And a few instants later, it didn't. Have to head back to work, hopefully talk later. Yeah. You have a great day at work, okay? And thank you for stopping by as always. Dual's throat. Suggesting a reading outfit for the avatar placed in right corner by the fire. Yeah! <laughs> Why do that face? No, 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 no. I don't know. <laughs> it would be amazing if you could sit in a chair, actually. But hey. <laughs> Sewell's throat hurt so he knew he had been screaming he was soaked with sweat his chest ached and his limbs were trembling he opened his eyes and forced his head up so he could see where he was a man stood in the doorway with a drawn sword. His eyes were very wide and blue beneath a shock of curly, barley-coloured hair. Swearing, Sol reached for his own weapon where it hung on the bedpost. Just hold on there, the fellow said, backing up. It's just you've been hollering, so I was worried something ha was happening to you. The dreamlight was still fading, but his mind was starting to turn. If the fellow had wanted him dead, he probably would be. Where am I? he asked, taking a grip on his long sword, despite his reasoning. In the lank fellow inn, the man replied. And then, after a pause, in Choral. Choral, right. Are you okay? I'm fine, Sul said. Nothing to concern you. Ah, yes. The man looked uncomfortable. Do you, um... Scream like that every... Uh... I won't be here tonight. Sul cut him off. I'm moving on. I didn't mean to offend. You didn't, Sul replied. The breakfast is out, down there. Thank you. Please leave me. 
The man closed the door. Sol sat there for a moment, rubbing the lines in his forehead. Asura, he murmured. He always knew the prince's touch, even when it was light. This has not been light. He closed his eyes and tried to feel the sea jump beneath him. To hear the old Kashyyyk captain's words. See again through his eyes. That thing appearing in the sky. Everything about it stank of oblivion. After spending twenty years there, he ought to know the smell. Wuhan, he sighed. It must be you, Wuhan, I think. Why else would the prince send me such a vision? What else would matter to me? No one answered, of course. He remembered a little more. After the Kashit had died, he had seen Il's heaven as he last saw her, pale and lifeless. And the smoking shadowlands had once been Morrowind. Those were always there in his dreams, whether Asura meddled with them or not. But there had been another face, a young man, Kolovian probably, with a slight bend in his nose. It seemed familiar, as if they had met somewhere. That's all I get? Sul asked. I don't even know which ocean to look in. The question was directed at Asura, but he knew it was rhetorical. He also knew he was lucky to get even that. He dragged his wiry grey body out of bed and went over to the wash basin to splash water in his face and blink red eyes at himself in the mirror. He started to turn away when he noticed. Behind him, in the reflection, a couple of books propped in an otherwise empty shelf. He turned, walked over, and lifted the first. Tales of Southern Waters, it announced. He nodded his head and opened the second. The most current and high adventures of Prince Atribus. This one read. And there, on the frontispiece, was an engraving of a young man's face with a slightly crooked nose. For the first time in years, Sol uttered a hoarse laugh. Well, there you go. He said, I'm sorry I doubted you, my prince. An hour later, armed and armored, he rode south and east toward madness, retribution and death. And though he had long ago forgotten what happiness was, he imagined it must have been a bit like what he felt now. Chapter 1 A pale young woman with long ebon curls and a male with muddy green scales and chocolate spines crouched on the high rafters of a rotting villa in Lilmoth, known by some of the festering jewel of Black Marsh. 
You're finally going to kill me, the reptile told the woman. His tone was thoughtful. His saurian features composed in the faint light leading down through the cracked slate roof. Not so much kill you as get you killed, she answered, pushing the tight rings of her hair off her face, and pressed her slightly aquiline nose and grey-green gaze towards the vast open space beneath them. It works out the same, the other hissed. Come on, Glim, Anaik said, tossing herself into her father's huge leather chair and clasping her hands behind her neck. We can't pass this up. Oh, I think it can be safely said that we can, Mia Glim replied. He lounged on a low weave cane couch, one arm draped so it as to suspend over a cypress, cypress end table whose surface was supported by the figure of a crouching Kashyyyk warrior. The Agonian was all silhouette because behind him the white curtains that draped the massive bay windows of the study were soaked in sunlight. Here are some things we could do instead. He ticked one glossy black claw on the table. Stay here in your father's villa and drink his wine. A second claw came down. Take some of your father's wine down to the docks and drink it there. The third, drink some here and some down at the docks. Gleam, how long has it been since we had an adventure? His lazy lizard gaze travelled over her face. If by adventure you mean some tiring and dangerous exercise, not that long. Not that long enough, anyway. He wiggled the fingers of both hands, as if trying to shake something sticky off them. A peculiarly Lilmothian expression of agitation. The membranes between his digits shone translucent green. Have you been reading again? He made it sound like an accusation, as if reading was another way of referring to, say, infanticide. A bit, she admitted. What else am I to do? It's so boring here. Nothing ever happens. Not for lack of your trying, Mia Gleam replied. We nearly got arrested during your last little adventure. Yes, and didn't you feel alive, she said. I don't need to feel alive, the Agonian replied. I am alive. Which state I would prefer to retain. You know what I mean. That is a bold assertion, he sniffed. I'm a bold girl, she stepped forward. Come on, Gleam. He's a weird crocodile, I'm certain of it. And we can get the proof. First of all, Mio Glim said, there's no such thing as a weird crocodile. crocodile. Second, if there were, why on earth would we care to prove it? Because, well, because people would want to know. We'd be famous and he's dangerous. People around there are always disappearing. In Pushbottom? Of course they are. 
It's one of the dodgiest parts of town. Look, she said. They found people bitten in half. What else could do that? A regular crocodile. Lots of things, really. With some effort. I might be able to do it too. He fidgeted again. Look, if you're so sure about this, get your father to talk underwarden Ethan into sending some guards down there. Well, what if I'm wrong? Father would look stupid. That's what I'm saying, Gleam. I need to know for sure. I must find some sort of proof. I've been following him. You what? He gaped his mouth in a credulity. He looks human, Gleam, but he comes and goes out of the canal like an agonian. That's how I noticed him. And when I looked where he came out, I'm sure the first few steps were made by a crocodile and after that by a man. Lean closed his mouth and shook his head. Or a man stepped in some crocodile tracks, he said. There are potions and amulets that let you even Gaspers breathe underwater. But he does it all the time. Why would he do that? Help me be sure, Gleam. Her friend simulated a long hiss. Then can we drink your father's wine? If he hasn't drunk at all. Fine. She clapped her hands in delight. Excellent. I know his routine. He won't be back in his lair until nightfall. So we should go now. Lair? Sure. That's what it would be, wouldn't it? A lair? Fine. A lair. Lead on. And now here we are. An egg thought. They had made their way from the hills of the old imperial quarter into the ancient gangrenous heart of Lil Moth Pushbottom. Imperials had dwelt here too in the early days when the Empire had first imposed its will and architecture on the lizard people of Black Marsh. Now only the desperate and sinister dwelt here, where patrols rarely came. The poorest of the poor, political enemies of the Argonian and Silil party that now dominated the city, criminals and monsters. They found their lair easily enough, which turned out to be a livable corner of a man's so ancient the first floor was entirely silted up. What remained was vastly cavernous and riggedy and not that unusual in this part of town. What was odd was that it wasn't full of squatters. There were just the one. He had furnished the place with mostly junk but there were a few nice chairs and a decent bed. That's all about all they got to see before they heard the voices coming in the same way they had, which was to say the only way. An egg and gleam were backed up in a corner and here the walls were stone. The only way to go up was up an old staircase and then even farther, using the ancient frame of the house as a ladder. An egg wondered what sort of wood, if wood it was, could resist decomposition for so long. 
The wall and floorboards here had been made of something else and were almost like paper. So they had to take care to stay on the beam. Gleam hushed himself. The figures in the group below were gazing up, not at them, but in their vague direction. Anaic took, took a small vial from the left pocket of a double-breasted jacket and drank its contents. It tasted a bit like melon, but very bitter. He felt her lungs fill and empty, the elastic pull of her body around her bones. Her heart seemed to be vibrating instead of beating, and the oddest thing was she couldn't tell if this was fear. The faint noises below suddenly became much louder, as if she was standing among them. Where is he? one of the figures asked. They were hard to make out in the dim light, but this one looked darker than the rest, possibly a Donmer. He'll be here, another said. He, or maybe a she, was obviously a Kashit. Everything about the way he moved was feline. He will, a third voice said. Anaic watched as the man she had been following for the last few days approached the others. Like them, he was too far away to see. But she knew him by the hump of his back. And her memory filled in the details of his brutish face and long unkempt hair. Do you have it? The Kashit asked. Just brought it under the river. Seems like a lot of trouble, the Kashit said. I've always wondered why you don't use an Agonian for that. I don't trust them. Besides, they have ripper eels trained to hunt Agonians trying to cross the outer canal. They are not so good at spotting me especially if I rub myself with eel slime first. Disgusting. You can keep your end of the job. Just as long as I get paid for it. He pulled off his shirt and removed his hump. Have a look. Have a taste if you want. Oh, Daedra and Divine, Anaic swore. From the beam they crouched on. He's not a werecroc, he's a skooma smuggler. You're finally going to kill me, Gleam said. Not so much kill you as get you killed. It works out the same. And now, an egg was quite sure that what she felt was fear. Bright, terrible animal fear. By the way, the Kashit below said, lowering his voice. Who are those two in the rafters? The man looked up. Such, if I know, he said, none of mine. I hope not. I sent Patch and Flip Flicks up to kill them. Oh, Kayak! And I kissed. Come on, Gleam. As she stood. Something whisked through the air near her, and a shriek 
tore out of her throat. I knew it, Gleam snapped. Yes, come on, we have to get to the roof. They ran across the beams and someone behind her shouted. She could hear their footfalls now. Why hadn't she before? An enchantment of some sort. There, Gleam said. She saw it. Part of the roof had caved in and was rafting on the rafters, forming a ramp. We scrambled up a, a bit. Something hot and, and wet was trying to pull out of her chest. And she hysterically wondered if an arrow hadn't hit her. If she was bleeding inside. But they made it to the roof and a 50 foot fall. She pulled up two vials and handed one to Mia Glim. Drink this and jump, she said. What? What is it? It's, I'm not sure. It's supposed to make us fly. Supposed to? Where did you get it? Why is that important? Oh, Thal, you made it, didn't you? Without a formula. Remember that stuff that was supposed to make me invisible? It made you sort of invisible? It made my skin translucent. I looked like a bag of offal walking around. She drank hers. No time, Gleam. It's our only hope. Their pursuers were coming up the ramp, so she jumped, wondering if she should flap her arms or... But what she did was fall and shriek. But then... She wasn't falling so fast, and then she was sort of drifting, so the wind actually pushed her like a soap bubble. She heard the men hollering from the roof, and turned to see Gleam floating just behind her. See, she said, you need to have a little faith in me. She barely got the sentence out before they were falling again. Later, battered and sore, stinking of the trash pile that broke their final fall, they returned to her father's villa. They found him passed out in the same chair Anaic had been in earlier that morning. He stood looking at him for a moment, at his pale fingers clutched on a wine bottle, at his thinning grey hair. She was trying to remember the man he had been before her mother died. Before the Ancelil wrested Lilmoth from the Empire and looted their estates. She couldn't see him. Come on, she told Gleam. They took three bottles of wine from the cellar. And wound their way up the spiral stair to the upper balcony. She lit a small paper lantern and its light poured two, poured full two delicate crystal goblets. To us, she said. They drank. Old Imperial Lilmoth spread below them. Crumbling hulls of villas festooned with vines and grounds overgrown the sleeping palms and bamboo. All dark now, as if cut from black. Velvet, except where illumined by the pale phosphorescence of Luke and mold, or the wispy yellow airborne shines, harmless cousins of the deadly will-o'-wisps in the deep swamps. 
There now, she said, refilling her glass. Don't you feel more alive? He blinked his eyes very slowly. Well, I certainly feel more aware of the contrast between life and death, he replied. That's a start, she said. A small moment passed. We were lucky, Gleam said. I know, she replied, but... What? Well, it's not Werecroc, but we can at least report the skooma dealers to the Underwarden. They'll have moved by then, and even if they catch them, that's a drop in the water in the ocean. There's no stopping the skooma trade. There certainly isn't if no one tries, she replied. No offense, Gleam, but I wish we were still in the Empire. Hi, Quake. Hi, sweetheart. No doubt, then your father will still be a wealthy man and not a poorly paid advisor to Anne Leo. It's not that, she said. It's just, there was justice under the Empire. There were honour. You weren't even born. Yes, but I can read, Mia Gleam. But who wrote those books? Bretons? Imperials? And that's Anselil propaganda. The Empire is rebuilding itself. Titus Mead started it, and now his son, Atribus, is at his side. They are bringing order back to the world, and we are just, just dreaming outside. Try again, just dreaming ourselves away here, waiting for things to get better by themselves. The Agonian gave his imitation shrug. There are worse places than Lilma. There are better places too. Places we could go, places where we could make a difference. Is this your imperial city speech again? I like it here. It's my home. We've known each other since we were hatslings. Yes, and if you didn't already know you could talk me into almost anything, you do now. But leaving Black Marsh, that you won't get me to do. Don't even try. Don't you want more out of life, Gleam? Food, drink, good times. Why should anyone want more than that? It's people wanting to make a difference, causing all the troubles in the world. People who think they know what's better for everyone else. People who believe they know what other people need, but never bother to ask. That's what your Titus Mead is spreading around. His version of how things ought to be, right? There is such a thing as right and wrong, Gleam, good and evil. If you say so. Prince Atterbrus rescued an entire colony of your people from slavery. How do you think they feel about the Empire? My people knew slavery under the old Empire. We knew it pretty well. Yes, but that was ending when the Oblivion Crisis happened. Look, even you have to admit 
that if Maroon's Dagon had won, if Martin hadn't beaten him, Martin and the Empire didn't beat him in Black Marsh, Gleam said, his voice rising. The Ansiglil did. When the gates opened, Argonians poured into oblivion with such fury and might. Dagon's lieutenants had to close them. Anaic really realized that she had been leaning away from her friend and that her pulse had picked up. She smelled something sharp and faintly sulfurous. Amazed, she regarded him for a moment. Yes, she finally said, when the scent diminished. But without Martin's sacrifice, Dagon would have eventually taken Black Marsh too and made this world his sport ground. Gleam shifted and held out his glass to be refilled. I don't want to argue about this, he said. I don't see that it's important. You sounded as if you thought so for a second there, old friend. I thought I heard a little passion in your voice. And you smelled like you were spoiling for a fight. It's just the wine, he muttered, waving it off. And all of the excitement for the rest of the night can we just celebrate that your flying potion wasn't a complete failure. She was starting to feel warm in her belly. The wine at its business. Well, yes, I, she said. I suppose that's worth a toast or two. They drank those. And then Gleam looked a little sidewise at her. Anyway, he began, then stopped. What? He grinned his lizard grin and shook his head. Quietly slides into snuggling baby Yoda plushie to listen to the story. Oh, hi Twishy. Hi sweetheart. You may not have to go looking for trouble. From what I've heard, it might be coming for us. What's this? The wind oracle put into port today. Your cousin? Ixtar Nasha's boat? Yeah. Says he saw something out on the deep. Something coming this way. Something? That's the crazy part. He said it looked like an island with a city on it. An uncharted island, an unmoored island, floating in the air, flying. Anaic frowned, set her glass down and wagged a finger at him. That's not funny, Gleam. You're teasing me. No, I wasn't going to tell you, but the wine... She sat up straighter in her chair. You're serious? Coming this way? It's what he said. Huh, she replied, taking up the wine again and sinking back into the chair. I'll have to think about that. A flying city. Sounds like something left over. From the Merethic era or before. She felt her ample ma mouth pull in a huge smile. Exciting! I better go see Hecua tomorrow. And so they finished that bottle and opened another. An expensive one. 
and outside the rains came, as they already did, a moving curtain, glittering in the lamplight, clean and wet, washing away for the moment. Lilmoth's scent of mildew and decay. Chapter 2 A boy was once born with a knife instead of a right hand. How so Colin had heard. Rape and attempted murder planted him in his mother. But she had lived and turned all of her thoughts towards vengeance. She laughed when he carved his way out of her and went gleefully into the world to slaughter all who have wronged her and many who had not. And when his victims were drowning in their own blood, they might ask, Who are you? And he would answer simply, Dalk, which in the northern tongue is an old word for knife. According to the legend, it happened in Skyrim, but assassins liked the story, and it wasn't that uncommon for a brash young up and coming killer to take that a lot, alias and daydream of making that cryptic reply. The knife in Colin's hand didn't feel remotely a part of him. The handle was slick and clammy, and it made his arm feel huge and obvious, hanging by his side just under the edge of his cloak. Why hadn't the man noticed him? He was just standing there, leaning against the banister of the bridge staring off towards the lighthouse. He came here each Loredas after visiting his horse at the stables. Often he met someone here. There was a brief conversation and they would part. He never spoke to the same person twice. Colin continued toward him. There were traffic on the bridge, mostly folks from Way going home for the night with their wagons and the things they hadn't sold at market, lovers trying to find a nice place to be secret. But it was stinging out. They were almost alone. There you are, the man said. His face was hard to see, as it was cast in shadows by a watchlight a little farther up. Colin knew it well, though. It was long and bony. His hair was black with a little grey. His eyes startling blue. Here I am, Colin replied, his mouth feeling dry. Come on over. A few steps and Colin was standing next to him. A group of students from the College of Whispers were loudly approaching. I like this place, the man said. I like to hear the bells of the ships and see the light. It reminds me of the sea. Do you know the sea? Shut up, Colin thought. Please don't talk to me. The students were dithering, pointing at something in the hills northwest. I'm from Anvil, Colin said, unable to think of anything but the truth. Ah, nice town, Anvil. What's that place, the one with the dark beer? The undertow. The man smiled. Right, I like that place. He sighed and ran his fingers through his hair. What times, eh? I used to have a beautiful villa on the headland of Topol Bay. I had a little boat, two sails, 
Just for playing near the coast. Try again. For playing near the coast. Now. He raised his hands and let them drop. But you didn't come here for any of that, didn't you? The students were finally moving off, talking busily of what sounded like a made-up language. I guess not, Colin agreed. His arm felt larger than ever. The knife like a stone in his hand. No, well, it is simple today. You can tell them there's nothing new, and if anyone asks, tell them that no food, no wine, no lover's kiss is as beautiful as a long, deep breath. What? A story, book three, chapter. What are you holding there? Stupidly, Colin looked down at the knife which had slipped from the folds of his cloak and gleamed in the lamplight. Their eyes met. No! the man shouted. So Colin stabbed him, or tried. The man's palms came up and the knife cut into them. Colin reached with his left hand to try to slap them aside and thrust again, this time slicing deep into the forearm. Stop it, the man gasped. Wait a minute, talk. The knife slipped past the threshing limbs and sank into his solar plexus. His mouth still working. The fellow staggered back, staring at his arm and hand. What are you doing, he asked. Colin took a step toward the man who slumped against the banister. Don't, he wheezed. I have to, Colin whispered. He stooped down. The man's arm came up, too weak now, to stop Colin from cutting his throat. The corpse slid into a sitting position. Colin slid down next to him and watched the students distant now, entirely unaware of what had just happened. Unlike the two men coming from the city who were walking purposefully toward him, Colin put his arm around the dead man's shoulders, as if the fellow had passed out from drinking and he was keeping him warm. But there wasn't any need for that. One of the pair was a tall, bald man with angular features, the other an almost snoutless cachet, Arcus and Kasha. Into the river with him, Arcus said. Now, just catching my breath, sir. Yes, I saw, quite a fracas, when all we asked you to do was slit his throat. He fought. We were careless. First time, Marcus, Kasha said, smoothing his whiskers and twitching his tail impatiently. How slick were you? Let's get him in the river and be gone. Fine. Lift, Inspector. When Colin did move, Arcus snapped his fingers. Sir, you meant me? I meant you. Sloppily done. But you did do it. You're one of us now. Colin took the dead man's leg. And together they heaved him over. He hit the water and lay there. Floating. Staring up at Colin. Inspector. He'd been waiting three years to be called that. Now it sounded just like another word. Put on this robe, Kasha said. Hide the blood until we get you cleaned up. Right, Colin said dully. He got his documents the next day from Intendant Morale, a round-faced man 
with an odd ruff of beard beneath his chin. You'll lodge in the till hall, Morales told him. I believe they already have a case for you. He put down the pen and looked hard at Colin. Are you well, son? You looked haggard. Couldn't sleep, sir. The intendant nodded. Who was he, sir? Colin blurted out. What did he do? You don't want to know that, son, Maral said. I advise you not to try and find out. But, sir, what does it matter, Maral said, if I told you he was responsible for the kidnapping and murder of six toddlers, would that make you happy? No, sir. What if I told you his crime was to make a treasonous joke about Her Majesty's thighs? Colin blinked. I can't imagine. You're not supposed to imagine, son. Yours is not the power of life and death. That lies far above you. It comes, in essence, from the authority of the Emperor. There's always a reason, and it's always a good one, and it is not your business. Do you understand? You do not imagine. You do not think. You do what you are told. But I've been trained to think, sir. This office trained me to think. Yes. And you do it very well. All of your instructors agree on that. You are a very bright young man. Or the pinnitus oculators would not have approached you in the first place. And you have done very well here. But any thinking you do, you see, is in service to your job. If you are asked to find a spy... In the Emperor's Guard, you must use every bit of logic at your disposal. If you are asked quietly, discover which of Count Carol's daughters has been poisoning his guests. Again, you use forensic training. But if you are given a clear order to steal, injure, poison, stab, or generally do murder... Your brain is only to help you with the method and the execution. You are an instrument, a utensil of the Empire. I know that, sir. Not well enough, or you wouldn't be asking these questions. He stood up. You are from Anvil, I seem to remember. One of the city guardsmen recommended you for testing. Regent Apprentice, yes sir. Without his recommendation, what would you be doing right now? I don't know, sir. But he did, in a general way. His father was dead. His mother barely got by doing laundry for the better off. He managed to teach himself to read. But his education wouldn't have been gone much further than that. And if it had, it would have, wouldn't have been of any use to him. At best, he might have worked out, worked in the shipyard or managed to hire onto a ship. The Imperial invitation had been a dream come true. Offering offer him everything he wanted as a young boy. And that was still the case, despite this. And now he would draw a salary. He could send his mother some of that before she worked herself to death. This is the test, isn't it, he said. Not last night. Now. The intendant ghosted a little smile. 
Both were tasked son. And this isn't the last. Just the last official one. Every day on this job is a new challenge. And if you're not up to it, the time to say so is now. Before you are in over your head. I'm up to it, sir, Colin said. Very well, then, Expector. Take the rest of the day off. Report for duty tomorrow. Colin nodded and walked away in search of his new lodgings. When Aeneic woke, Mia Glim was still sprawled on the floor, his breath rasping loudly. Oh, she muttered as she rose, pressing her throbbing thorp temples, feeling her belly turn. How much wine had they drunk? She stumbled her way to the kitchen, winced as the sun excuse me, winced at the sun as she uh, unshuttered the windows. She built a fire in the stove, then opened the walk-in pantry in a diffused light and considered the sausage hanging in the bundles. The long blaze of salted pugfish, bells of flour, salt, sugar, rice, a pitiful basket of mostly wilted vegetables. There were eggs on the counter still warm. So Tai Tai must be up and doing his job. Which wasn't always the case. And there were her mother's antique leather bound spice case. With its 78 bottles of seeds and dried leaves. Everything she needed. Mia Glim wandered in a few minutes after the garlic and chilies hit the oil, and the air went sharp and pungent. I'm too sick to eat, he complained. You'll eat this, an egg told him, and you'll like it. Old Tenny used to make this for Dad before we couldn't afford her anymore. If that's so, why is it different every time you make it? Last time it had peanuts and pickled pork, not chilies and garlic. We don't have any pork pickle, she replied. It's not the specific ingredients that matter, it's the principle of composition. The balance of essence flavors, oils, and herbs. Saying that, she emptied the spices she had ground a bit before with mortar and pestle, and the earthy scents of coriander, cardamom, lady mantle seeds, and ginger wafted about the kitchen. She added two handfuls of crushed rice, stirred that a bit, covered it with a finger of coconut milk and set it to simmer with a lid on the pot. When the porridge was done, she ladled it into two bowls and added slices of venison sausage, red ham and pickled watermelon rind. Rind, sorry. That looks disgusting, Mia Gleam said. Not done yet, she said. She broke two eggs and dropped them raw into each bowl. Gleam perked up and his tongue licked out. Goose eggs? Mm-hmm. Maybe I'll try it. She set a bowl in front of him and after an experimental bite, he began downing it with gusto. An egg tucked into her own. I already feel better, Mia Gleam said. 
See? Yes, yes. He took another bite. So, tell me more about this floating city, she said. When it is, when is it supposed to be here? Ick said they outpaced it for three days and it never changed course before they finally got the wind they needed to really leave it behind. It was headed straight here, he said, and will arrive sometimes early tomorrow at the pace as it's coming. So what did he figure out it was? A big chunk of rock, shaped like a top. They could see buildings on the rim. The ship's wind caller didn't like it. Quit the minute they got into port and left town, fast, on a horse. What didn't the wind caller like? He kept saying it wasn't right, that none of his magics could tell him anything about it. Said it smelled like death. Did anyone t take word to the organism? I can under never understand you two when you're together, a soft voice whispered. She turned her gaze to the door and found her father standing there. That smells good, he went on. Is there any for me? Sure, Tex, she said. I made plenty. She ladled him up a bowl and passed it. He took a spoonful and closed his eyes. Better than Tenithar's, he said. Always in the kitchen, weren't you? You learned well. Do you know anything about this, an egg said, a bit impatiently. It always bothered her, talking to her father, and she knew it shouldn't, and that bothered her twice. But he sounded so soul weak, as if most of his spirit had leaked out of him. I wasn't kidding, he said. You've been like this since you were children. I recognize a few words here and there. And Neig waved the old complaint aside. This flying city that's supposed to be heading towards us. Do you know anything about that? I know the stories, he sighed, picking at the stew. It started with Erwin. And Nayak rolled her eyes. Crazy old Sidic priest, or whatever they call themselves. Said he felt something out in the deep water. A movement of some kind. So yes, he's crazy. And the Anxilil are irritated by him. Especially Archwarden Kashalil. So he was dismissed. But then there were reports from the sea. And the organism sent out some exploratory ships. And they're still out there. Looking for a phantom probably. After all, Erwin has been spreading his message down at the docks. No wonder if sailors are seeing things. My cousin's ship put out to sea from Anwell th three weeks ago, Mirgleam said. He did not talk to Erwin. Her father's face tightened oddly, the way it did when he was trying to hide something. Tyek, she said. Nothing, he replied. It's nothing to worry about. If it's dangerous, the Anselil would meet in the same might that drove the Empire out of Black Marsh and the Dunmer out of Morwen. But what would a flying city want with Lilmoth? What do the Hiss say? Aeneg asked. The spoon hesitated halfway up to her father's lips, 
then continued. He chewed and swallowed. Taeg. The city three said it was nothing to worry about. Mieglim made a, a high, scratchy humming sound and fluttered his eyes. What do you mean, this city tree? He hesitated as if he had said too much. Lorcan's bit, Gleam and I said. We are not visitors here, you know. He nodded. She hated how he was when he spoke straight Tamrielic. He didn't sound like himself. It's just the hist. They are all connected of some of the same mind, so they mention the city tree is in particularly. Her father's eyes searched about a bit aimlessly and he sighed again. The Ancelil in Lilmos talk only to the city tree. What's the difference? Aeneic said. Like Gleam yes. said. Yes. yes! They are all connected at the root, right? So what the city tree says is what they all say. Gleam's face was like stone. Maybe not, he said. What's that mean? Aeneic, her father started. His voice sounded strained. When he didn't continue for a moment, she raised her hands. What, Taek? Thank you for the shout out to Twishy Bishy. <laughs> no, that is okay. Thistle, this might be a good time for you to visit your aunt in Leowin. I've been thinking you ought to anyway. I went so far as to set aside money for the voyage, and there's a ship leaving at dawn. That sounds worried to me, Teg. It sounds like you think something is wrong. You're all that's left me. That matters, the old man said, even if the risk is small. He opened his hands, but would not meet her eyes. Then his forehead smoothed, and he stood. I have to go. I am called to the organism this morning. I will see you tonight, and we can discuss this further. Why don't you pack in case you decide to take the trip. For a moment she saw father. Leowin was an ocean voyage away, but from there she could reach the Imperial City, even if all she had were her own two feet. Maybe. Can Gleam go? I'm sorry, I've only money for one passage, he replied. I wouldn't go anyway, Gleam said. Right then, her father said, I'll be off. I'll have dinner brought from the Coquina Thistle. No need to cook tonight and we'll talk about this. Right, Teg, he said. As soon as he was out of earshot, she leveled a finger at Mia Glim. You go down to the docks and see what that crazy priest has to say. And anything else you can find out. I'm going to Hikuas. Why Hikuas? I need to fine tune my new invention. Your falling potion, you mean? It saved our lives, she pointed out. On a related note, Gleam said, Why, but in rotting wells, are you worried about flying at this time? 
How else are we going to get up on a flying island? By catapult? And I will be right back because we have lightning and thunder at the moment. There we go. One thing is to have it in the background of me reading, but not in real life. I don't like it. Windows were open. <laughs> ah, mere gleam side. Ah, uh, no. Look at me gleam, Anaix said, slowly, reluctantly. He did so. I love you, and I love to have you along. But if you don't want to go, no worries. I'm not going to give you a hard time. But I'm going, Sue. He held her gaze for a moment, and then his nostrils contracted. Sue, he said. Meet you here at noon. As Mia Gleam followed Lilmoth's long slump to the bay, Imperials named Orlis, he felt the cloud ripple sky gentle pressing on him, on the trees, on the ancient ballast stone paving. He wondered, which is to say that he gave his mind its way, let it slip away from speech into the obscure nimbus of pure thinking. Words hammer through into shape, but in the in the cages, bound in the chains, Jell, the tongue of his ancestors, was the closest speech to real thought. But even Anaic, who knew as much as Jell as anyone, not off the root, the throat couldn't make all the right sounds, couldn't shade the meanings enough for him to really converse with her. Thank you so much for the pen, Lurk. Ay, 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 ay. For the Lurk, Ben. Jesus Christ, now I can't even speak properly. Yes! Yes! yes. <laughs> that was a break. Yes. He was four people really, mere glam the Agonian when he spoke the language of the Empire, which cut his thoughts into human shapes. When he spoke to his mother or siblings, he was Wutilu de Sax Leo. When he spoke with Sax Leo from the deep forest, or even with a member of the Anti Leo, he was Lukilu. Assimilated because his family had been living under imperial ways for so long. When he spoke with Anaic, he was something else. Not between the two, but something very different from either. Gleam. But even their shared language were far from true, true thought. True thought was close to the root. 
The hiss were many, and they were one. Their roots burrowed deep beneath the black soil and soft white stone of black marsh, connecting them all, and thus connecting all Saxleo, all Argonians. The hiss gave his people life, form, purpose. It was the hiss who had seen through the shadows, through the oblivion crisis, who called all of the people back to the marsh. Defeated the forces of Maroon Zagon, drove the empire into the sea, and laid waste to their ancient enemies in Morrowind. The Hist were of one mind, but just as he was four beings, the mind of the Hiss could sometime escape itself. It had happened before. It had happened in Lilmoth. If the city tree had separated itself, and the Angselil with it, what did it mean? And why was he going to do what Aeneic had asked him to do, rather than trying to discover what was happening to the tree whose sap had molded him. But he was, wasn't he? He stopped and stared into the bulbous stone eyes of Son Mael the fisher. Once ascendant, organ lord of Lilmoth. Now all that was visible of him was his lower snout up to his head. The rest of him was sunken, like most of ancient Lilmoth, into the soft, shifting soil the city had been built on. If one could swim through mud and earth, there were many Lilmoths to discover beneath one's webbed feet. An image arose behind his eyes. The great step pyramid of Istach Hithril met, only the topmost chamber still jutted about the silt, about the Anxilil had excavated it, room by room, pumping it out and laying magics to keep the water from returning, as if they wanted to go back, not forward, as if something were pulling them back to the ancient Lilmoth. He stopped, realizing he was still walking without knowing exactly where he was going. But then he knew. The undertow of his thoughts had brought him here. To the tree, or part of it. The city tree was said to be 300 years old, and its roots and tendrils pushed and wound through most of Lower Lilmoth, wound, it must be wound, wound through the most of Lower Lilmoth. And here was a root the size of his thigh, twisting its way out of a stone wall. Everything else around him had become waterish, blurred, but as he laid his wet hand on the rough surface, the color sharpened and focused. He stood there, no longer seeing the crumbling, rotted imperial warehouses, but instead a city of monstrous stone, segurats and statues pushing up to the sky, a place of glory and madness. He felt the tremor around him, smelled anise and burning cinnamon. and heard chanting in antique tongues. His heart thumped oddly as he watched the two moons heave themselves through the low mist of smoke and fog that rolled through the streets, and the waters surged beneath them, around them, beyond the sky. His thoughts melted together.
He wasn't sure how long it was before his mind complicated itself again. But his hand was still on the root. He lifted it and backed away. And after a few long breaths, he began walking. And in a thick night around him, the massive structure softened, thinned, and went mostly away until he once again in the little moth where his body was born. Mostly away, but he felt it now. The call the angsty Leal felt, and he realized that a part of him already had known it. That is his name. Mostly away, but he felt it now, the call the angsty Leal felt, and he realized that a part of him had already known it. He knew something else too. The tree had cut him off from the vision before it had run its course. That was troubling. Dolls swarmed the streets, like rats near the waterfront. Mostly of them, most of them too greedy or stupid to even move out of his way, as he picked his way through fish offal, shattered crabs, jellyfish and seaweed. Barnacles went halfway up the buildings here. This part of town has sunk so low that when in double tide came, it flooded deep. The ducks themselves floated, attached to a massive long stone quay whose foundations were as ancient as time and whose upper layer of limestone had been added last year. He made his way up the central ramp to the top of it. Here was a city in itself. Since the Ancelil forbade all, but licensed foreigners in the city. The market had all crowded themselves here. Here a fishmonger held a flounder up by the tail selling from a single crate of silver skin harvest. There, a long lot of sheds with the Calorian tra traders, banner hawk trinkets of silver and brass, cooking pots, cutlery, wine cloth, wine and cloth. He had worked here for a while. A group of his Matriline cousins had set up a business selling Taylor, Taylor, a liquor made of distilled sugarcane. <clears throat> they originally sold the cane, but since their fields were 20 miles from town, they found it easier to transport a few cases of bottles that many wagon loads of cane and far more profitable. He knew where to find Erwin, right in the thick of it all, where the great stones cross that waterfront joined. The Sijik wasn't yelling, as usual. He was just sitting there, looking through the crowd and past the colourful mast of the ships to the south, toward where the bay came to the sea. His bone-coloured skin seemed paler than usual. But when the silvery eyes found mere gleam approaching, they were full of life. You want to know, don't you? he said. For a moment, mere gleam had trouble responding. The experience with the tree had been so powerful 
but he let words shape his thoughts again. My cousin said he saw something out at the sea. Yes, he did. It's nearly here. What is nearly here? The old priest shrugged. Do you know anything about my order? Not much. Few do. We don't teach our beliefs to outsiders. We counsel. We help. Help with what? Change. Mia Gleam blinked, trying to find his answer there. Change is inevitable, Erwin went on. Indeed, change is sacred, but it's not to be unguided. I came here to guide the Ancilio and the city council. The organism that they so thoroughly control do not listen. They have a guide, the hist. Yes, and their guide brings change. But not the sort that ought to be encouraged. But they do not listen to me. Truth be told, no one here listens to me. But I try. Every day I come here and try to have some effect. What coming, Mirglin persisted. Do you know of Arteum? the old man asked. The island you Cities come from, Gleam answered him. It was removed from the world once. Did you know that? I did not. Such things happen, he nodded. More to himself, it seemed, than to mere gleam. Has something been removed from the world, he asked. No, Erwin said, lowering his voice. Something has been removed from another world, and it has come here. What will it do? I don't know but I think it will be very bad. Why? It's too complicated to explain, he sighed. And even if you understood my explanation, it wouldn't help. Mundus, the world, it's a very delicate thing, you know. Only certain rules keep it from returning to the is, is not. I don't understand. The Sijik waved his hands. Those boats out there. To sail and not founder. The sails and the ropes that hoist them. Control them. Tensions must be just so. They must adjust as the winds change. If a storm comes, they may even have to be taken down. He shook his head. No, no. I feel the ropes of the world, and they have become too tight. They pull in the wrong directions, and that is never good. That is what happened in the days before the dragon fires first burned. Are you talking about oblivion? I thought we can't be invaded by Oblivion anymore. I thought Emperor Martin. Yes, yes, but nothing is so simple. There are always loopholes, you see. Even if there aren't loops. Erwin grinned at that but didn't reply. So this city, Mia Glyn.
Mayor Gleam said, it's from oblivion. The priest shook his head, so violently. So violently, Mayor Gleam thought it might come off. No, no, no. Or yes. I can't explain. I can't. Go away. Just go away. Mia Gleam's head was already hurting from the conversation. He didn't need to be told twice, although technically he had been. He wandered off to find his cousins and procure a bottle of Thelu. Anaic could wait a bit. My boy is calling, be right back. Chapter 4 Hecua's single eye crawled its regard over Anaic's list of ingredients. Her wrinkled dark brow nodded in a little frown. Last try didn't work, did it? Anaic puffed her lips and lifted her shoulders. It worked, she said. Just not exactly the way I wanted it to. The red god shook her head. You have the knack, but no doubt about that. But I've never heard of any formula that can make a person fly. Not from anywhere. And this list. This just looks like a mess waiting to happen. I've heard of Lathrum of the Synod worked out a way to fly, an egg said. Hmm. And maybe if there was a Synod, conclave within 400 miles of here, you might have a chance of learning that. After a few years paying their dues. But there's a spell, not a synthesis. A badly put together spell likely won't work at all. Alchemy gone wrong can be poison. I know all of that, Aeneas said. I'm not afraid. Nothing I've ever made turned out too bad. It took me a week to give Mir Gleam his skin back. He had his skin, Aeneas pointed out. It was just translucent, that's all. It didn't hurt him. Hekua passed her lips together in disdain. Well, there's no talking to the young, is there? She held up the list and began picking through the bottles, boxes and canisters on the shelves. They made up the walls of the place. While she did so, Anaic wandered around the shelves too, studying their contents. She knew she didn't have everything she needed. It was like cooking. There were one more taste needed to pull everything together. She just didn't have any idea what it was. The Kua's place was huge. It had once 
in the local mages guild hall and there were still three or four doddering practitioners who were in and out of the rooms upstairs. The Coeur honored their membership, even though there were no such organization at just as the major skills anymore. No one cared much. The Ancigleal didn't care, neither the College of Whispers nor the Synod. The two imperially recognized institutions of magic had representatives in Lilmoth, so they didn't have anything to say about it either. She opened bottles and sniffed the powders, distillations and essence, but nothing spoke to her. Nothing. That is, until she lifted a small, fat bottle, wrapped tightly in black paper. Touching it sent a faint tingle travelling up her arm, across her clavicle, and into the back of her throat. What is this? Hakua asked. And Anir realised her gasp might have been audible. She held the container up. The old woman came and peered down her nose at it. Oh, that she said. I'm really not sure, to tell you the truth. It's been there for ages. I've never seen it before. I pulled it from the back while I was dusting. And you don't know what it is? She shrugged. A fellow came in here years ago. A few months after the Oblivion Crisis, he was sick with something and needed some things. But he didn't have money to pay, but he had that. He claimed he'd taken it from a fortress in Oblivion itself. There was a lot of that back then. We had a big influx of Daedra hearts and void salts and their like. But he didn't say what it was. She shook her head. I felt sorry for him, that's all. I imagine it's not much of anything. And you never opened it to find out. Hecua paused. Well, no, you can see the paper is intact. May I? I don't see why not. Anaeg broke the paper with her thumbnail, revealing the stopper beneath. It was tight, but a good twist brought it out. The feeling in the back of her throat intensified and became a taste, a smell, bright as sunlight but cold, like eucalyptus or mint. That's it, she said as she felt it all meld together. What? You know what it is? No, but I want some. Anaic, I'll be careful, Aunt Hack. I'll run some virtue tests on it. Those tests aren't well proven yet. They miss things. I'll be careful. Hmm, the old woman replied doubtlessly. The house, as usual, was empty, so she went to the small attic room where she had all of her alchemical gear and went to work. She did the virtue test and found the primary virtue was restor restorative and secondary was, more promisingly, one of alteration. The tertiary and quaternary virtues didn't reveal themselves even so vaguely. But she knew, knew right to her bones, that this was right. And so she passed hours with her calcinator. And in the end, she was turning a flask containing a pale amber fluid that bent light oddly, as if they were a half a mile of liquid instead of a few inches. Well, she said, 
sniffing it. Then she sighed. It felt right. Spelled right. But her cure's warning was not to be taken lightly. This could be poisoned as easily as anything. Maybe if she just tasted a little. At the moment, at that moment she heard a sound on the stairs. She stayed still, listening for it to repeat itself. An egg? She sighed in relief. It was only her father. She remembered he had been bringing food home, and a glance out her small window proved it was near dinner time. Coming, Teg, she called, quirking the potion and stuffing it in her right skirt pocket. She started up, then paused. Where was Glean? He'd been gone an awfully long time. She went to a polished cypress cabinet and withdrew two small objects wrapped in soft gecko skin. She unwrapped them carefully, revealing a locket on a chain and a life-size likeness of a sparrow constructed of a fine metal, the color of brass, but as light as paper. Each individual feather had been fashioned exquisitely and separately, and his eyes were garnets set on ovals of some darker metal. As her fingers touched it, it stirred, roughing its metal wings. Hey, Ku, she whispered. She hesitated then. Ku was the only thing of value her mother had left her. That hadn't been stolen or sold. Sending her out was a risk she didn't often take. But Gleam had had more than enough time to get to the waterfront and back. Hours and hours more. It was probably nothing. Maybe he was drinking with his cousins or something, but she was eager to find out what the Sijic priest had to say. Go find Gleam, she whispered to the bird, conjuring the image of her friend in her secret eye. Speak only to him, hear only at his touch. She purred, lifted her wings and drifted more than flew out of the window. An egg, her father's voice again, nearer. She went out, closing the door behind her. She met him near the top of the winding flight. He was red in the face from wine or exertion, or probably both. Why didn't you just ring the bell, Tex? she asked. Sometimes you don't come down right away, he said, stepping aside. After you. What's the rush, she asked, descending past him. We were going to talk, he said. About the trip to Leowin. That and other things, he replied. The stair came to a landing and then continued down. What other things? I haven't been a very good father, Thistle. I know that. Since your mother died, there was that annoying tone again. It's been fine, Teg. I've got no complaints. Well, you should. I know that. I tell myself that I've been doing what's needed to keep us alive. To keep this house. He sighed. And in the end, all meaningless. They passed the next landing. What do you mean, meaningless? She asked. I love this house. You think I don't know anything about you, he said. I do. You pine to live 
here, this place. You dream of the imperial city of studying there. I know we don't have the money, Taeg. He nodded. That's been the problem, yes. But I've sold some things. Like what? The house, for one. What? She stopped her foot on the floor of the antechamber, just noticing the men there. Four of them. An imperial with an obby nose, an orc with dark green hide and low brushy brows, and two Bosmeri, who might have been twins with their fine, narrow faces. She recognized the orc and the imperial as members of the Chagnet Calcium, oh my god, that was a tongue twister, and Dry Killers, the only non agonian guard unit in Lilmoth. What's going on, Teg? she whispered. He rested his hand on her shoulder. I wish I had more time, Thistle, he murmured. I wish I could go with you, but this is how it is. Your aunt will see you get to the Imperial City. She has friends there. What's happening, Teek? What do you know? It doesn't matter, he said. Best you not find out. She brushed his hand from her shoulder. I'm not going to Leowin, she said. Certainly not without a better explanation, and certainly not without you and Gleam. Gleam, he exhaled, then his face changed into a visage utterly alien to her. Don't worry about Gleam, he said. There's nothing to be done there. What do you mean? She could hear the panic building in her voice. It was as if it had pulled itself outside of her and become a thing of its own. Tell me. When he didn't answer, she turned and strove for the door. The orc stepped in her way. Don't hurt her, her father said. And Eric turned and ran ran as fast as she could towards the kitchen and the other door, the one that led to the garden. She was only halfway there when hard, calloused hands clamped on her arm. I owe your father, the orc growled, so you'll be coming with me, girl. She writhed in his grasp, but the the others were all around her. Her father leaned in and kissed her forehead. He stank of black rice wine. I love you, he said. Try to remember that in the days and years to come. That in the end, I did right by you. With half a bottle of Thalo sloshing in his belly, Mir Glim made his wobbly way back towards the old Imperial district. He knew Anik was going to be irritated with him for not returning sooner. But at that moment, he didn't care that much. Anyway, it wasn't much fun watching her concoct her smelly compound, which is what she has been surely been doing all afternoon. He hadn't spent much time with his cousins lately, or with anyone, except an egg, really. If he had, he might have known he wasn't alone, in feeling a bit cut off from the tree. That only, the Ansiglio and other even while the people from the deep swamps seems to enjoy complete report with it. 
That was bothersome in a lot of ways. And perhaps most bothersome was that his mind, like many of his people, had a hard time believing in coincidence. If the tree was doing something strange at the same time a flying city appeared from nowhere, it seemed impossible that there wasn't some connection. Maybe an egg's father was right. After all, the old man did work with the Ancelio. Maybe it was time to go, away from Lil Moth and its rogue tree. If it was rogue, if all the hiss weren't involved, because if they were, he would have to get out of Black Marsh entirely. A light rain began spluttering the mud-covered path as he passed beneath the pocket eroded limestone arch that had once marked the boundary of the imperial quarter. He well jumped as a fluttering motion at the edge of his vision-opened ancient template. But what he saw there wasn't a venine bat or blood moth. It took him a moment to sort out that it was an ex metal bird, who. She must be really, she must really be irritated, he thought. She rarely used coo for anything. He blew out some of the water that had collected in his nose and flipped open the little hatch that covered the mirror. He didn't find an air gazing back at him, though. It was dark, which meant the locket was closed. But it was emitting faint sounds. He pressed the bird nearer his ear. At first, he didn't hear much. Breathing. The muffled voices of two men. But then suddenly a man was shouting, and a woman shrieked. He knew that shriek like he knew his own. It was an egg. Back here, girl, a hoarse voice growled. Just tell my father you put me on the ship, he heard an egg shout. You'll never know the difference. Maybe he wouldn't, hoarse voice grunted. But I would, yeah? So on the boat you go. An egg then vented a string of profanities, some of which she almost certainly had made upon at the spot, because Mere Gleam hadn't heard them before. And he had pretty much heard all of her arsenal of swear words and phrases. Or thought he had. With a grunt, he turned around and started back down towards the dock. It seemed an egg's father did know something. Something so bad he had his own daughter kidnapped to get her out of town. Well, that was great. Now he felt worse about everything. He began to run. Well, guys... We have now reached chapter five. Let me see, let me see, let me see. Would this be a good cliffhanger that he is running back?
then we can continue reading that on Wednesday. What do you guys say? Wait, go away. <laughs> You're welcome, Ginger. You are most welcome. So, as we are close to ending, I would like to say thank you guys for yet again listening to me. On this on this new book, The Infernal City. Yes, O Lord. Thank you for reading. It is always so calming. Oh, you are so sweet, Ginger. You are so sweet. Yes. 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 Let's see, who should we... Who should we raid, guys? Can you find me someone to raid? Should we raid Jay Hart? Mr. Who? What is that? Apex Legends. She would. All right, we can do that. So, guys, get ready to copy pasta, and I would highly appreciate it if you would stay for the raid. It means a lot to me. Yep, something new. It's cool. Cool, cool, cool. So we're going to raid Mr. Underscore. Oh, underscore. What? Nine, one, six. Thank you guys for yet again being here with me. Um, we started off with a new book today, uh, ESO Lore. 
the infernal city. Uh, we're going to continue that on Wednesday. So, I hope to see you guys on on Wednesday for continuing on the book, but also tomorrow where we're going to continue the Way of Shadows and uh, some ESO. Uh, but if you can't wait all the way until tomorrow, I will be going live in a few hours again, but I have to take a break. So I will see you guys later. Remember, I love you and I will see you for some VIS plus two progression. Yay. Bye bye. Where the heck are they at, though? I found him with the wings.